Portions of Aviation Highlights were made possible by a donation from Dynamic Recording Studio and by Rulo Associates, a full-service advertising and public relations agency. Hi, I'm Paul Pakish. This is the July edition of Aviation Highlights, a monthly program about aviation in and around the Rochester area. You'll remember that last month we started a story about U.S. Air's Fear for Flyers program. Right now we'd like to start with part two. If you saw the June edition of Aviation Highlights, you'll remember that Carol Stauffer and Captain Frank Petit teach a Fear for Flyers program sponsored by U.S. Air. The class meets once a week in a seven-week program designed to help people overcome a fear of flying. Carol Stauffer is a clinical social worker who teaches behavior modification so that a person can deal with his or her fear. Captain Frank Petit explains how the aircraft work and what keeps them in the air. They have also written a book based on the course. It started back in 1975 in Pittsburgh, and I'm a clinical social worker, and I was working with people with phobias, and one woman I worked with had a fear of flying. So I contacted a number of airlines in Pittsburgh to start a program for fearful flyers. And U.S. Air is based in Pittsburgh. That's their operations base. And they were very interested in helping me. So we formed a, a partnership, and we've been doing it since 1975. Okay. How did you get involved in it? Well, I was uh, director of pilot training at that particular time in 1975. So uh, uh, wanted one of our needed one of our captains to uh, work with Carol in the program. So I I just went ahead and worked with it, and I really enjoyed it that first year. And so she came back the second year, and and uh, so I, I I helped her again. Uh, at that time, we only did one program a year. And then after a few years, we increased it to four. We took the show on the road and increased it to four different cities. Then later we increased it to ten cities a year, which is what we're doing now. And so I've stayed involved with it right from the beginning. So some of your cities are regulars and others are rotating? Yes, we do two, six, or six regular cities each year, and then we try to add some new ones. Altogether, we do ten cities a year. Okay, and Rochester is on the regular list. Rochester is a regular city for us. We had lots of people in Rochester. I guess there are probably two reasons for that. One is that uh, that that we just don't have any trouble filling up the class. Uh, we we don't take over fifty, and uh, generally speaking, we're right up against fifty here at, at Rochester. And then uh, Sam Cooper is has been so helpful to us through the years that uh, we we really enjoy coming here and working with him. Do your classes generally fill up fast? I mean, is, are there a lot of people you have to turn away? Well, it's estimated there are 25 million Americans afraid to fly. That's one out of every six adults. So, yeah, we get big numbers in lots of cities. We turn people away in Philadelphia, sometimes in Pittsburgh. The first time we go into a city and do our first class there ever, um, it, it isn't usually a full class because by the time you get the word out to people and they know that there's such a thing available, it takes some time. Okay, you mentioned these people who have something scare them. Are those people more likely to be scared by their own experiences or say a big national air disaster that happens to be in the news? It, I think that goes in both directions. Uh, uh, people will be scared by even a neighbor telling them that they were scared in an airplane, something happened to them. Uh, like, like the neighbor may tell them that they were on an airplane that was in turbulence and the airplane dropped 4,000 feet or something like that, even though that sort of thing uh, isn't at all likely to happen, probably didn't happen, uh, that still was enough to scare them. Uh, you, you ask about the uh, accidents, recent accidents, does that scare people? Uh, yes, it, it does, but on the other hand, people in our classes remember accidents from 10 years ago and sometimes 20 years ago. They don't, they don't have to have recent accidents to be afraid. Do you cover terrorism at all? Uh, to, to some degree, we don't. It's, it's interesting that, that uh, most of the people we get in the classes 
don't seem to worry too much about that. They're worried more about themselves on the airplane. They're worried about their claustrophobia. They're, they're worried about the fact that they're not in control during the flight. Uh, they worry about whether they're going to have a panic attack and make a fool of themselves in the airplane. They're much more worried about that than they are as far as uh, terrorism is concerned. And the other thing is, uh, the things that we teach them during the program uh, allow them to put things in, in perspective. And terrorism has to be put in perspective. You know, because you can have a terrorist that starts shooting up uh, children in a schoolyard. And uh, they're, they're more likely to do that even than they are to, to uh, terrorize an airplane. So I... How about some of the recent news events that have to do with um, planes falling apart in the sky, so to speak? Well, there, there's no doubt that the fact that there have been a couple of incidents uh, where we have had uh, structural failure in, in flight, there's no doubt that that, does, that has scared people. And uh, we, we, uh, we look at that uh, j just, the, just the way it is. Uh, we come back to the fact that really, even though there were two recent ones, there are very, very few cases of structural failure in flight. And most people, uh, uh, now because we talked about the aging aircraft, they're, they're afraid it's because the airplanes are old and that the airlines aren't maintaining them properly. Well, it, this really isn't the case. And uh, we're, we're able to convince them that the airlines, are, the, the airplanes are still being maintained very well. But because we have some of the bigger airplanes, like the 747s, that for the first time are reaching uh, the point where they've had quite a few flying hours, they've been around quite a few years, and they they experience what we call cycles, uh, uh, cycles of takeoff and a landing. And during each cycle, the airplane is pressurized and depressurized. And it's the fact that now these big airplanes like the 747, they're reaching the point where there have been more of these pressurization cycles that we've found that we do have to look at the airplanes more carefully in some areas than, than we were looking at them before. And uh, maybe not just looking at them, but just going ahead and replacing parts where we really didn't feel we had to do that before. So there's never an accident happens that, that uh, there isn't a good bit to learn from it. And uh, there is much, much activity, very expensive activity going on now because of the concern about the aging aircraft. And, and I think you're going to find that in, in the future, that we're not going to have structural failures in flight any more than we have in the past. How could somebody get somebody else in the family to fly? Well, With, I mean, um, if they refuse to take your program yes. or read the book. Well, I guess if they refuse to take the program, I certainly would buy the book for them because I think that's going to give them lots of good information. We also have a relaxation tape that is very helpful. They can get that from us. I try to find out what they're afraid of, what's bothering them. You know, if it isn't a very severe fear, they just have a little bit of claustrophobia, um, there are some things you could do. First of all, I'd tell the flight attendant when I got on the airplane that I had a fear of flying. You could get them a seat on the aisle where they don't feel so closed in, a seat up near the front of the plane. But first of all, you really have to find out what they're worried about. And one other example of that is that uh, uh, people will say they're afraid to fly because, or they won't fly because they're afraid of heights. And uh, uh, one of the things that we tell the class members is that uh, I, I don't know any pilot that isn't afraid of heights the way they're talking about. That's talking about uh, looking out of a high bridge or, or a high building or standing up on the roof painting it or something like that. I, I don't know any pilot that's, that's comfortable doing that. But there is no connection between that kind of fear of heights and in an airplane. And uh, so people get over that particular fear quite, quite easily as they go through our program. And hopefully, reading our, our book, they will feel much better about their fear of heights. You've um, probably had a lot of experience flying jets. Um, you go back before jets? Oh yes, oh yes. I, I, go, I go back to before World War II with some pretty primitive prop airplanes. DC planes? Oh yes. Have you had any um, frightful flying experiences that you could pass along? No, as a matter of fact, I, I use this as a very positive thing in the program because I tell people I've been flying for over 50 years. I have uh, something over 23,000 hours of flying time. 
I have never been in what you would consider a life-threatening situation in an airplane. And I know thousands of pilots, I know very few who have. Certainly some, some, some uh, going back to wartime, some maybe being stunt pilots, so, or some actually were in a life-threatening situation in, in an airline airplane. But th there, those are very, very few and far between. And so that, that, that is one of the uh, things that I think that really helps people, knowing that you could actually fly this long and never, never have a problem. And yet many of our fearful flyers think, think that they're in a life-threatening situation every time they're in an airplane. They really aren't. If you would like to know more about U.S. Air's Fearful Flyers program or the book written by Captain Frank Petit and Carol Stauffer, write to them at U.S. Air, Box 100, Glenshaw, Pennsylvania, 15116. It's time for the history portion of Aviation Highlights with Paul Roxon. It would be interesting uh, to help uh, divulge, divulge some interest information how the control tower evolved here at the airport. We had no control tower at all. And one night, Clarence Robinson, who um, ran a flying service here, had a charter trip in his brand new Stinson, it was only two weeks old, and he was returning from Buffalo at night. Elmer Page was hauling passengers for Ray Holland, and um, the two met an intersection of two runways. They were both on the ground, both doing maybe about 15 miles an hour. And the um, Waco, the power of the Waco chewed about two feet off the wing of Clarence Robinson, brand new Stinson really lined. Well, Robinson was livid with anger, and uh, he sued Highland. Highland countersued, and the two lawyers got together and said, hey, wait a minute, it's nobody's fault, really, at night, what you need here is a control tower. There's no control tower here. So the city uh, immediately um, uh, instituted proceedings for putting a control tower in operation. And it was that low, like a chicken coop on top where the Weather Bureau is located at the present time. When all we had was a light, no radio, you had a, well, for approach, you had a, a green light if the coast was clear, a red light if you were to take it around again, or for a red and alternate red and green light, if I remember correctly, you are to change runway. Well, this went on. It was sort of a haphazard type of an operation. And it was not, and, but that tower was used for about, oh, maybe 15, 16 months, and then there was another collision. Once again involved Elmer Page and Doc Watson, who was a physician who had his own uh, fair tower 24, Dr. James Sibley Watson, was his full name. And it was nobody's fault, really. Elmer was given a green light to make an approach. The tower operator never saw Doc Watson because, look, you had a, uh, there was a little blind spot in that tower and he never saw it. Well, the two came together about 15 feet above the ground. And, um, Doc Watson's plane uh, sustained, uh, or oh, landing gear was uh, wiped out, the uh, plane was setting up on its nose, uh, gasoline's pouring from the carburetor, and I can't remember what happened to the, um, to the walk. Well, I don't think there's damage too badly. And then he, once again the airport realized we need a control tower that has 360 degrees unlimited vision. So they put up a temporary control tower for only 60 days. That was in 1936. And that control tower remained in operation until nine, instead of 60 days, until 1949. And that control tower is now in front of the administration building on Brooks Avenue. It was 40 feet high. And um, they installed some uh, radio equipment in there. But there was one problem with that control tower. And, um, and that was when you had a pretty good wind. The thing used to rock back and forth. And one of the tower operators would get seasick or air sick or tower sick, whatever, and he'd have to come down, there'd be nobody in the tower. <laughs> Occupational hazard. Uh, so that was uh, the development of, um, uh, as far as the control tower is concerned. What we have here is one of the early uh, women pilots in the Rochester area. The first one was Blanche Scott, who uh, was from Rochester, became the first woman pilot in the country. And what we have here is a picture of Ruth Barron, who uh, flew a Waco F. She had a commercial license, and she was killed in a women's national air races in 1936.
What you see now is a Curtis Robin, and it's not a very good picture. However, that was a very famous plane. The pilot happened to be Doug Wrongway Corrigan, and that is a plane he flew ostensibly uh, taking off from New York for California and wound up in Ireland. It was powered by a Wright J65 engine, and when it came into Rochester, I was not here at the time, but I was told one of the mechanics opened the door and the door came right off in his hands. And uh, he did get a mechanic to fix the hinge on the door at a later time. Have you ever met him? I, no, I did not. Uh, those of you who are students of history may be interested in knowing during World War II, Rochester played a very predominant role in the training of Air Force cadets. One of such a program was right here in Rochester. RBI was the contractor, and several thousand cadets went through the program here. They received eight hours of flight instruction. And here is a picture of some of the cadets uh, at the time. You may be interested in reading the book, A Bright Shining Lie by Neil Sheehan. This is regarding a cadet who married a Rochester girl and then uh, became a career officer in the Air Force and spent many years in Vietnam. And the book portrays basically what happened during the Vietnam War. However, I remember the cadet John Van, and it was on this program. I happened to be in uh, moonlighting as an instructor that I had him as one of my uh, cadets. Coming up on August 19th and 20th, the National Warplane Museum in Geneseo will host its annual 1941 Warplane Air Show. We'll be covering the air show itself in detail in our September edition of Aviation Highlights, but right now we'd like to take a preview of the museum itself. The National Warplane Museum is located just east of Geneseo in the Genesee Valley. Its collection of warplanes focuses on World War II and the Korean War. Mert Evans is one member of the museum who was there in both wars. World War II, I flew 42 active combat missions with the 13th Air Force and a B-25. Then I transferred to 13th Air Force headquarters as a combat trained pilot to take the staff out on missions, which we didn't get credit for. I think I got another 40 of those. But uh, in doing this, I had 600, well, almost 600 combat hours in uh, 42 missions and something like 1,800 hours in the B-25. So I know a little bit about it. In Korea, I flew C-47s. Uh, we had two missions. One was to staff 5th Air Force headquarters for service airplanes, and the other was a psychological warfare mission over Korea where we dropped pamphlets and fly over with loudspeakers and drop infiltrators back of the lines and that sort of thing at night. Well, I've been elected by the board of directors as the ambassador of the museum, and I do a lot of public speaking. I talk to Kiwanis units and things like that. We'll go out and give a little show and speak to them, so I'm the ambassador. <laughs> Dr. Bill Anderson is a Geneseo orthodontist whose aviation interests fit right in with the theme of the museum. Well, I bought my P-40 back in 1969. Uh, at that time, we didn't have a museum. Uh, there wasn't any thought of it. And the museum came about approximately uh, six years ago. Now, this was an airport before that, right? Just a grass strip or something? Yes, it's been a grass strip for about... 30 years. I'm on the board of trustees and uh, I'm on the executive committee and I'm also chairman of uh, long range planning and I do a little flying too once in a while. It was an extremely humid and hazy day in late June when Dr. Bill Anderson took me up for aerial photographs in this plane.
Bill Lau is a private pilot who became very interested in what the museum is doing. I actually have been interested in airplanes all my life. Uh, it goes back to my father and my grandfather who were smart enough to teach me years ago to look up when you hear the sound of an airplane or take me to airports and just make sure that I was very conscious of aviation and the role that it had played in our history and that naturally led to the National Warplane Museum when I came into the Rochester area. How did you get involved in the Warplane Museum? How did you find out about it? Oh, as a matter of fact, it was one of their shows that I came to some years ago when the show was considerably smaller than it is now and uh, took a look at the organization and said, this is something I would definitely like to be a part of and signed up as a member, was an inactive member. In other words, I was a member, but I was not a direct participant in the operation of the museum until about a year ago. Uh, and a year ago, it sort of got out of control. Uh, I got to be uh, a tour guide first, uh, and since then have become one of the air show announcers, and also run the uh, membership committee for the museum. Owen Hughes painted the nose art on Fuddy Duddy, the National Warplane Museum's B-17 Bamu. And this is what I used to do during the war, I was painting the pinup girls on the B-17s and B-24s and patches on the pilots' uh, jackets and all the artwork was required. It was uh, not really my job because they didn't have a job for an artist, but since I did this work, this is all they gave me to do. <laughs> Morale booster thing. These are some photographs of last year's air show. It was 1985, as a matter of fact. The, the B-17, which we own, was a, uh, a plane that was built by Douglas back in 1945. I'll give you a little history of the aircraft. Uh, it was built in 1945, which was toward the end of the war. So it never actually saw combat. In fact, the aircraft that are now flying of the B-17s, none of them were ever actually in combat in this country anyway. Six B-17s were at the show, and a formation flight of all six of them was the highlight of the 1988 Wings of Eagles air show. What happened was it was sent to a depot in the Pacific, sat out the rest of the war, and then was converted into a VIP transport. Among others, General uh, MacArthur and General Eisenhower used this aircraft as a transport when it was in the military service. In 1985, Globe Air had four of these. They were, I believe, the last four that were in commercial operation in this country, and they discovered that they were getting very expensive to operate. So they decided to sell them at auction down in Mesa, Arizona. And we heard about it. We checked out this particular airplane. When I say we, others from the museum. And they went down and bid on it. They purchased it for $250,000 and brought it back here. They flew it back here. And since that time, we have been trying to restore the airplane to its original glory, which has meant, you know, putting turrets back on it, putting guns in it, changing the nose glass, repainting it. The aircraft is painted as one that uh, another airplane that flew with the uh, 447th bomb group out of Rattleston, England during the war in 1943 and it was named Fuddy Duddy and the reason that we selected that name was because this aircraft had the distinction of flying 96 missions without an abort. In other words, 96 times able to go out and drop the bombs and come back without having to turn back. On its 97th mission though, the original Fuddy Duddy collided with another B-17 over Mannheim and was lost along with all but two of the members of that crew. There are, however, about 16 members surviving from the first three crews, and in 1987, when we dedicated the aircraft in the name Fuddy Duddy, we had them in here, and they had a glorious weekend with the airplane. I might also mention that uh, Dominic Zapparo is uh, one of the original crew members from Fuddy Duddy, he happens to be a member of our museum, lives right down in Leicester, right close to the museum, and that also is partly how we came to choose the name Fuddy Duddy for our aircraft. Now, is this a, rec a recent acquisition, or...? Yeah, this, we've had this about three months. This was, uh, came to us via the, it's a Curtis Commando. C-46 came to us via the Smithsonian, which is on loan from the Smithsonian on an indefinite term, and uh, is an airplane that, uh, right now, we can't fly. It has to be on static display because those are the rules of the Smithsonian. Can you describe some of the other planes you have here at the museum? Well, we have uh, the P-40 Warhawk, of course, which Dr. Bill Anderson flies, which is uh, one of only ten, as I said, that still fly in this uh, country. It also is the only one that's still in existence that defended the North American continent, having flown in the Aleutian campaign with the RCAF. Uh, we also have a PT-26, which is a primary trainer, hence the PT designation, and a PT-17 Stearman, which is another primary trainer. Uh, both of these aircraft are uh, extremely uh, fun aircraft to fly, although when you were a student pilot, I'm sure in World War II, it wasn't a lot of fun because you had to learn a lot of really bad stuff with them. Directly behind us as we speak here is a BT-13, which was a basic trainer. 
And this is an airplane that in the next stage of training, after primary training, you went to the basic trainers. And this was a bit faster, it was a little bit different design, and it would teach you a little bit more about flying. And from there you would go into the pursuit planes, which were not called fighters until the Korean War, pursuit being a throwback to World War I, when they figured you had to chase the enemy. It wasn't until Korea that they said, heck, we're fighting them, let's call them fighters. So they did. In addition to the uh, BT-13, we have a PBY-6, which of course is the uh, patrol bomber built by uh, Consolidated, named the Catalina. That one has uh, hopefully only a few more weeks work on it and it will fly, but one never knows. They've been working on it for two years. We have a P-47 under construction, uh, under refurbishment. That one has quite a number of years to go before it will fly, I would say, from the looks of it. Also on the line is a C-45 or JRB or Beach 18, depending on your bent, it had all those names, C-45 being Army Air Force. This is a twin engine transport. And we're not interested at all in glorifying war. That's not the idea. What we would like to do is glorify instruments of freedom. Uh, when you take the B-17 aloft, uh, it's a rare privilege, and uh, you feel as if you're riding along with the soul of a great nation. Uh, because the B-17 touched the, the lives of millions of people in World War II, right from the girls who riveted the aircraft together to the um, men who maintained and flew the airplane to the millions of people in Europe who watched the B-17s fly over. The reason we have this place here is to remember the people that were in it in World War II in Korea. and. Uh, that's exactly why we have it, why we have all the memorabilia, and why we have the airplanes here. Uh, you remember the good parts. You don't remember the bad parts of the, of the war. There were a lot of bad parts, too, but you don't think of those. Like, uh, I think everybody remembers the good things. I never got seriously injured. I never lost my airplane. I lost some of my friends in missions, but uh, I guess I was lucky. I came out without too many scratches. And after 40 years, you kind of forget a lot of the bad stuff, you know? <laughs> Only in fairly recent years has there been a move now to preserve them, especially in flying condition. That's another thing that's unique about our museum, I think, is that we preserve them with a the goal of flying them. A lot of people say, oh my gosh, you shouldn't fly them because they're priceless relics. If you break them, you're, they're irreplaceable. I don't think people can really appreciate a vintage aircraft unless they see it in their in its element which is of course the sky on the ground they're lovely to look at but they were meant to fly and not to fly them to us at least seems almost a crime so the air show seems to keep getting bigger every year oh, yeah. what do you have planned for this year uh, this year is going to be as good as last year even better we hope we're going to have three of the four engine airplanes that fought in world war ii here at the air show b24 and a British Lancaster and seven, currently seven B-17s. On the weekend of August 19th and 20th, the National Warplane Museum will hold its annual 1941 Wings of Eagles Air Show at the Geneseo Airport. The Rochester Pilots Association will have a free aviation movie night on Friday, July 28th. It's at the Air Park Great Life Health and Fitness Club, 1250 Scottsville Road and starts at 6 p.m. The movie to be shown is the great Waldo Pepper. On the weekend of July 22nd and 23rd, there will be a fundraiser for cerebral palsy. Plane rides will be available at Will Air West for a donation to cerebral palsy. Will Air West is part of hangar number three on Scottsville Road. That'll do it for the July edition of Aviation Highlights. I'm Paul Packish. Join us again in August for another edition of Aviation Highlights. Portions of Aviation Highlights were made possible by a donation from Dynamic Recording Studio and by Rulo Associates, a full-service advertising and public relations agency.